This week on Life in the Carolinas, we'll check out some exciting water features right here in the Mount Holly area. Our philosophy is kind of have fun and not get too serious with it. Our cooking expert, Liz Bichel, shows us how to make a quick and easy egg souffle. How easy is that? Yeah, very easy. And North Wilkesboro's most colorful newspaper man shares some unbelievable stories about his incredible collection. The big panel behind me is the control panel off the electric chair in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's all coming up right now on Life in the Carolinas. Closed caption brought to you in part by moxicopy.com, America's source for reliable quality printing, delivered right to your door at a price you're going to love. Life in the Carolinas is brought to you in HD by Hampton Inn & Suites at Phillips Place. Moxicopy.com has the confidence of customers nationwide, like Wooten & Wooten auctioneers of fine art and antiques, whose demand for quality is high. In our business, we deal with serious antiquities, and our catalogs are important to us. MoxieCopy.com gave us the price, quality, and speedy delivery that we could count on to get the job done. For the best price, quality, and service, turn to MoxieCopy.com. Sold. Mount Holly, North Carolina has an abundance of outdoor water activities. Hello, I'm Carl White, and we're enjoying some time right here on the Catawba River. You know, this is one of those truly hidden treasures of the Carolinas, and we've had an opportunity to enjoy a lot of what nature has to offer. Right now we're located on the Catawba River uh, in an area called the Tuckasegee Ford. When I get up every day and I come to work and I look out my office window, I have the best view in the world, and it just, it's, it's just amazing. It's very relaxing, calming, it takes all the stresses of the day away down here. Most people come out here and they just have a good time. They'll get out and paddle and spend a few hours. They'll swim. Uh, we rent kayaks and canoes and paddle boards. We do classes, uh, everything from basic kayaking to yoga on stand-up paddle boards. We get people out there and our philosophy is kind of have fun and not get too serious with it. I do some fun things. I'll stand on my head. I'll try to do the uh, tree pose. I mean, I'm not really a yoga guy, so. It's kind of fun. A lot of people have a great time here on the water, but the Mount Holly waterways, well, they have another vital role to play. We live on Mountain Island Lake, which is a piece of the Catawba River. And uh, it's one of the smaller lakes, but it is also the water intake for all of Mecklenburg and Gaston County. So our lake serves the water needs of about three million people. When you turn on your water faucet, you just expect to see water, good, clean water, and that is what it, a lot of people on the lake are really trying to preserve. We work with the Catawba River Keepers. We do a lot of work with them. We're involved in a, a program called River Sweep, where we actually go out, we'll clean up the river. I mean, I think nowadays people are more conscious of what they do and what they throw away and how they get rid of things. There's seven dams and they were mostly built by Duke Energy. And when the dam was built and formed the lake, this area had rolling hills, as you can see actually in, in the surrounding area still. You'll find that the hills and valleys are all very obvious through the lake. And so when you drive on the lake, it can go from 30 feet to eight feet in a very fast time. We get a lot of people that will come from out of town and they'll stay in a local hotel and they'll come out and they'll rent the boat for a few days, they'll take the pontoon boat out fishing. We even have a few people go out camping overnight on the river and just kind of enjoy the river and what it has to offer, the fishing, the swimming, the, the boating. As we leave our dock and go under the Route 16 bridge, we go further down and around an actual mountaintop and it's um, an area that is very much used in the summertime for people to pull their pontoon boats up and they can picnic there and it's just a beautiful quiet area. It's very special here in the morning uh, when the sun rises. Uh, this morning was very nice. It had a lot of steam coming off the water. 
all the wildlife is still here and they're not hiding. You can see the birds, you can see the turtles, you can see the fish, um, the osprey hunting and fishing. It's, it's just really pretty down here. The osprey is kind of like a symbol of this lake. Mount Holly has a lot of parks and a lot of woods, and the birds, they love it here. We have, of course, a lot of ducks, an awful lot of squirrels. <laughs> the deer are still very plentiful. We're keeping track of the ecology, and as a result, we're able to keep a lot of the wildlife. It's a beautiful area, and one that also has a rich and colorful history. It is really the first documented crossing of the Catawba River by Charlotte. It was part of the Takasiji Trail, and it was used by Indians and early white settlers alike. It's been used in the Revolutionary War, transport troops across here. So it, there's a lot of history in this area. Of course, it's our major drinking water source, but in addition to that, it's a wonderful recreation source. Several of our parks are along the river, and they were planned with the river in mind. And of course, we're right across the river from the Whitewater Center. The U.S. National Whitewater Center sits adjacent to the Mount Holly region of the Catawba River. And as you can see, this is a great place to have a wonderful time. Being able to come down with your family to Mount Holly, the ease of access to the water, to come out and be able to go out on a boat, paddle, or take a pontoon boat out and spend an hour all day, go out and do some exercise, commune with nature, come back, have a picnic, a barbecue, it's just priceless. We moved a lot, we lived on a lot of air bases, and coming down to Mount Holly, I was just awed at how welcoming the people were, how friendly they were. I really feel like it's home to me, and that's saying a lot, because for 40 years we didn't have any home. <laughs> Mount Holly, North Carolina, has attracted people from all over the world. Some have made it their home. So whether you stay for a day or a lifetime, I think you'll be glad you did. And nature's waiting. When we come back, Liz helps make an easy egg souffle. Is that hard? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> and we'll meet a newspaper man who loves collecting pieces of history. When the light stops blinking, they know he's dead and they cut it off. Closed caption brought to you in part by Moosehead Grill, home of Uncle Donnie's national award-winning wings. Our cooking expert, Liz Michelle, travels all over the Carolinas, meeting some of the great chefs of the region and asking them to share some of their favorite recipes. Recently, Liz traveled to the Yellow House Bed and Breakfast in Waynesville, North Carolina, where she picked up this excellent recipe. We're here at the Yellow House Bed and Breakfast Inn in Waynesville, North Carolina with Sean Bresnahan. And Sean always shares such wonderful recipes with us. Today, we're going to make easy egg souffle, and it is very easy. It is the easiest egg souffle recipe you'll ever make, Liz. Okay, good. <laughs> now we're going to use a Monterey Jack and Pepper Jack combination with this souffle. We do the basic egg souffle right here, but as you can see, we've got some sun-dried tomatoes, some green chilies, some jalapenos. First thing we're going to do, let's start with some eggs. Okay. And I'm going to crack them and I want you to whisk the heck out of them, okay? We're going to use five eggs. No shells in there yet? Yeah. That's what I get. Okay. There we go. And whip that up good. I don't want any yolks. There we go. Okay. Okay. Good technique. A little bit more risk. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Now, the, the easy part is just adding everything else. So we're throwing in our butter. And we're going to throw in our cottage cheese. And I like to use a little spatula just so we get it all out. And our flour. Okay. And you want to use just all-purpose flour. Our baking powder. A little bit of salt, salt? Right. and then throw our cheese in there. All right. all right, now just mix it all together. Okay. Is that hard? No. No. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Get it all whipped in. Now we're going to put these into our ramekins, our six to eight ounce ramekins. Okay. 
and we want to spray them with a little vegetable oil just so we know that they will come out once they're out of the oven. And you don't have to measure to put it in there. And I just like to spread it out until we've just used up all of our mixture. You're going to just fill it up. And you want about oh, maybe three quarter way up the uh, ramekin. Okay. You scrape that so we get every little bit of it. Yeah. And we're going to just throw that in our 350 degree oven for about 30, 40 minutes. How easy is that? Yeah, That's very awesome. easy. So our easy egg souffle has just come out of the oven and it's beautiful and it smells awesome. <laughs> We're going to grab the ramekin. It's a little warm. I've got Cook's hand so I can handle it, but you want to use a towel. Use a spoon and just kind of go around the sides just to loosen it up and then just pour it right onto the plate. Flip it over. Nice, nice colors. Yeah. It is wonderful. The, the only thing left to do is dig in. Please. Okay, Absolutely. Okay. Mmm. Mmm. Oh. Mmm. Oh, it's good. Isn't that good? Mm hmm That cheese in there. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you. You're Thank very you welcome. So much, Sean from the Yellow House Inn in Waynesville, North Carolina. Come see them. Sean will make you this wonderful breakfast. Have a great day. Thanks, Sean. You uh -huh. too. I will now. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things is to meet interesting people. So I was elated to meet Ken Welburn. Ken publishes a weekly newspaper called The Record in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. And he's also a collector of very cool and strange stuff. It's obvious that there's no focus to this collection of stuff. It's just kind of a whatever comes through the door or whatever I run across. And that's the fun of it, too. It's kind of a poor man's museum, you know. They don't charge them anything to get in, but they can have a great time if they be patient and look. If you stand and patiently look toward the light at this stick, you're going to say, oh, my God, how did they do that? So you take a look, all right? And there's no naked ladies in there. Don't get all excited. But there's only one way it'll work. A lady came in my office with that stick and said, are you Ken Welburn? And I said, yes, ma'am. I understand you will buy anything. And I said, well, an opening like that, what you got? You know, and one thing led to another. I bought that stick. I was amazed. Inside there is a picture of a huge building. And it's on a lake, you can tell. And it's got horses pulling carriages. And on the lower end of, the, of, of it, it says, International Exposition, Fairmont Park, Philadelphia, 1876. Which is why I say it's the neatest stick since the one Moses tossed down in front of Pharaoh. Ken's also a collector of great stories. The big panel behind me is the control panel off the electric chair in Raleigh, North Carolina called Old Sparky. If you notice the uh, light blinking, all right, well, when they turn the switch, when the light stops blinking, they know he's dead and they cut it off. And there's not a word of that that's true, but it's a great story to tell. Um, actually, that's a control panel off a generating plant that the American Drew had for about 60 years. They made their own electricity at the plant there at the end of this street. People come in from the bait outside. It looks a little bit like an antique store. It's not much like a newspaper office, I gotta admit. One of the things I learned early on, though, is that old newspapers are great sources of conversation. For example, they have to have a great big alleged in here now to keep it politically correct. This one is called North Wolf for a Hustler. Everybody smiles when I say that. And look at this, Dr. Sam's Jury Deadlock. That is the fugitive Dr. Sam. This is the one the story was all about in the, it's been in, in, on the TV and in the movies and stuff. Here's an ad from Spain Hours from 1931, you see. The, the local business history of the area. Uh, the Yellow Jacket. This, um, this is from 1947. It had a nationwide circulation. Ardon Laws wrote it. It says, our aim to swat liars and leeches, hypocrites and humbug, demagogues and dastards. Now, he didn't mince any words. This is my favorite newspaper in the whole place. News World goes to war. Be back soon. Their employees joined the war effort and left, and they never actually started publishing again. And in those days, you didn't go to war for a hitch. You went to war till you got through. I never intended to be doing anything I do for a living nowadays, but it seemed like all my life, one way or another, been connected to the newspaper business. When I was 11 in 1960, I got a newspaper route. Best thing that ever happened to me, 
nearest thing to being an independent businessman you'll ever have. And if everything worked well, I netted about six bucks a week after I paid my paper bill, six dollars and a half sometimes. And in 1960, Cokes were a dime. Candy bars were a nickel. A nickel candy bar big enough to pass around to your buddies. One morning, I threw the paper to Miss Finley's house, and I heard the glass break. Well, when I got back home that day, I asked my dad, what should I do? He said, well, son, you gotta fix it. After school's out today, go down and see her, tell her you broke the window, she's gonna know that. Find a paper in the front room, you know, and said, uh, just tell her to get it fixed, and you'll pay the bill, that's all you can do. It can't cost you a piece of paint like glass, that shouldn't cost 50 cents, you know, it shouldn't be a big deal. I walked over to the counter, I said, Miss Finley, I came to pay for that window. She said, fine, didn't smile. Got out this big black pocketbook underneath the counter there and laid this piece of paper down and pushed it over to me. I just barely could look, read it good and it said, John V. Barger Construction Company, two men, Finley House, glaze in window, 2250. In 1960, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't speak. I knew if I started talking, I'd start crying. You couldn't cry in front of a girl. That's the code of the great unwashed up on Henshaw Street. Didn't cry at all if you could help, but certainly not in front of a girl. But I felt my lower lip quivering. You know how that is. It's, I just, I was all to pieces. I was wiped out. This is gonna kill me. I couldn't pay my paper bill Monday. But I'd promised I'd pay her. So I started counting my money out. In no time, I was past any folding money. I was stacking up quarters for this lady. Whole time she stood there glaring down at me, getting a little taller and a little sterner every time I'd look up. Still afraid to speak because I, I could just I knew I'd start crying. I finally got it all counted out down to dimes. I got it counted out, and finally she spoke and she said, "Fine, if you willing to pay to fix that window, so am I." And she pushed my money back to me and wouldn't take a cent. And I learned a lesson from that lady, a life lesson I never forgot about kindness to somebody. And from that day on, I didn't care how stern she was, I referred to her as an angel on the second floor at Spain Hours. When we come back, if you think the stuff Ken has in his office is impressive, just wait till you see the really incredible stuff he keeps at home. If you know anything about the printing trade, to make a sheet like this, this took untold amounts of time and work to, to print and make it register so pretty. You notice all the things are in line. And for 1874, that's a phenomenal job to do printing. And the sad thing is, the guy that brought it to me rescued it from the landfill of all things. And maybe one day we'll get the back fixed on it, but in the meantime, it, it gets as much traffic as anything in the place. Listen to Ken telling me how his collection came to be. I realized this was a man who cared about the past and wanted to preserve it in the best way he could. And this is true not only for his office, but just a short distance away, his home as well. We like to call our apartment the Mayflower, named so because the most recent business that was in this part of the building was the Mayflower Beauty Shop. Matter of fact, the front door still has the Mayflower Beauty Shop sign on it. It's interesting that, that all the exposed brick you see, that's because of the moisture from the beauty shop. All this has been bypassed now. We rewired it and conduit it, but in order to hold on to the history of the building, we tried to hold on to all this kind of stuff to make people realize just what, just how it was used before. Same thing with the ceiling, the floors, the walls, you know. Did our, our very best to hold on to the history of the building the best we could, and it was built about 1909 or 1910. It's the first place I've ever lived my entire life that was just exactly what I wanted. And uh, I, I've got to say, uh, my wife, Laura, uh, I finally found me a woman that will watch for the law while I'm cutting the boards out of your old barn. So she enjoyed it much as I do and has had a great deal to do with where stuff is sitting, you know, and things like that. And it, it made it a lot of fun. This place is full of things that have great commentary that comes with them. For example, the uh, sink came out of the old North Wilkesbury Elementary School been torn down for some time now, but I got about three months in there before they tore it down. The refrigerator and the stove are 1948 fridge day. We use them both every day. Now, again, you'll hear me say this over and over. They made them to work. They made them to last. Computers are an abomination of Satan himself. And they, they make them, they sell them to you, and they know that an hour after you get them, there's gonna be something better behind it, but they don't care. And so I'm just not the most computer fan in the world, you know. But uh, that's, again, the fascination of the old thing. It made it to work. This is our bedroom and sitting room and dressing area. 
and kind of where we live, you might say. The parlor stove is from the 1850s. It now has a gas log in it. And then, of course, there's a 115-year-old Singer sewing machine. The last of my old sinks from the school is in this room. And then we have a 1930-era crane two-piece in the uh, toilet room there. The way we set this up, try to keep it open again, is to put this partition here with the glass block so that it separates the bathroom part from the bedroom, but at least it, it kind of gives you a, uh, an openness as well. I especially enjoy the doors all through the apartment that came from the schoolhouse. This is my fifth grade classroom door. I was actually a rotten kid in elementary school and I didn't have very many teachers that I remember very well from those days. This room is sort of a sitting room. Uh, my wife does a little sewing here, does a little bookkeeping here. And this is probably one of the earlier entertainment centers. It's got a radio as well as a record player. But again, I carried all the way through. You can see where the beauty shop there was a mirror hung right there. You can see the outline of the mirror um, where it hung all the way when it was a Mayflower Beauty Shop, which is our favorite part of it. And I have an old curling machine from 1918. These are very fascinating pieces and are, are, are great fun to have. And, and this one is fully functioning. Now this is basically what I like to refer to as my backyard. It's a 14 by 24 foot steel deck. It's a beautiful view of the mountains without having to drive all the way to them. That's one of the things that's kind of I love about this place in general. It's hidden in plain sight. And there's a few fascinating things about it, most especially is our little porch. It's a typical GSA thing from the 20s. It's done right. All that that looks green is actually copper. And uh, we put tempered glass in, and it kicks the heat back, and it can be 100 degrees right here, but it's 85 over there, and you still enjoy your lunch. So it's really been pretty fascinating. I've got a fireplace out here. I do burn wood, watch the Panther game. It's just a fascinating place to be and uh, to, to enjoy life. Ken has certainly collected some remarkable things in his life, but he's quick to point out it's not the stuff that makes his life complete, it's the people. I could not ask to have folks around me that I enjoy being with anymore every day of my life. And uh, it's a small business, but it's a great business, it's a fun business, and, and, um, and I don't know uh, how long we'll be at it, but I cannot imagine why anybody would retire from this job. I also can't imagine how anybody with three ex-wives ever going to retire. So it's just kind of the two works together pretty good the way it is, you know. <laughs>